In the last lesson, we talked about monohybrid crosses and dihybrid crosses. Um, and we looked at various symbols and how you can look at the phenotype and the genotype, the gametes, and the ratios of the various combinations of phenotypes and genotypes that you end up with. Today I want to talk about a few variations on the normal basic process of inheritance, monohybrid and dihybrid. And we'll begin with the test cross. You may well have read a little bit about that earlier in the textbook. But it's a very useful tool. This is the important point that the test cross is designed to assist with. If an organism express, is expressing the dominant characteristic in its phenotype, it's not immediately possible to know whether the genotype of the organism is homozygous dominant or heterozygous. Take, for example, the, 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 the old favourite eye colour. Someone's got blue eyes, sorry, someone's got brown eyes. They could be homozygous dominant. They could be heterozygous. Both of those individuals are going to have brown eyes, but they happen to be carrying that particular allele. In this particular example, it's not an issue. There's no um, um, sort of evolutionary advantage to having blue eyes or brown eyes. But in certain circumstances, um, people who are involved in animal and plant breeding would like to know if the organism that they're dealing with has got this recessive gene in it, recessive allele in it. And so the test cross is a mechanism to find out that information. Last point on the page there. This can be important if a plant or animal breeder is trying to get rid of undesirable recessive characteristics. If the recessive allele happens to produce something that is undesirable, it might be, uh, for example, in sheep, it might be a dark wool colour. Now, if you're a sheep breeder, um, breeding sheep for wool, basically what you want is white wool because that's going to be much easier to turn into dyed cloth and so on. If you end up with brown sheep, you could still do the same thing, but it's an expensive process. You'd have to first bleach the wool and then you can process it. So an ideal sheep farmer is going to know that all his sheep are always going to be white. So, test crossing the unknown genotype with an individual who is homozygous recessive for the characteristic. That's basically the definition of how a test cross works. You've got the unknown genotype, so it's either going to be homozygous dominant or it's going to be heterozygous. If it's heterozygous, it's got the potentially unwanted allele in the, in the uh, genotype. If you take that individual and cross it with a known homozygous recessive individual, you can work out whether or not the original parent was homozygous, which is what you want, or heterozygous, which perhaps you don't want. So here's an example. In pea plants, let capital T be the dominant allele for tallness and lowercase t be the recessive allele for short. So you take your unknown tall plant, so that relates to the red symbols, with a homozygous recessive short plant. So, two possibilities. The parent was either homozygous or heterozygous. If the unknown plant was homozygous, all the offspring will be tall. Here's your homozygous tall plant. Here's the homozygous recessive short plant. And simple monohybrid cross, all the offspring are going to be heterozygous for tallness. So they're all going to be tall. So that, that you, you, you're pretty sure then that what you've got was a homozygous individual. So if you don't want to be involved with breeding the recessive allele, that's the organism that you will use because that hasn't got the recessive allele in it. If on the other hand, the unknown plant was heterozygous, remember that's still going to be tall, so you don't know, cross it with the homozygous recessive short plant and you're going to get half of the offspring are going to be short 
and the other half are going to be tall. And if you have that situation and you're trying to get rid of the recessive characteristic, you won't then use this individual for breeding purposes. You'll discard that one and keep these ones. So after a few generations, a breeder of animals or plants can get rid of the recessive allele. One thing we have to be careful of here, though, is that this is not perfect. This is not perfect. The chances are, just like when you toss a coin, the chances are that you'll get half the time heads and half the time tails. And in this case, we've got these two individuals. The chances are that half of them will be tall and half of them will be short. But if you only happen to have two offspring from this cross, they could both be tall, in which case you could be fooled into thinking you've got this situation. Whereas in fact, statistically, by chance, these were the two that were born. Equally, those two could be born. We'll talk about the idea of the statistical importance of genetics in a later section of the topic. But in general, you could say that if you get all tall offspring, the chances are that you had a homozygous dominant parent. But you might not have done. Just like when you toss a coin, you throw, toss a coin five times, you might get five heads. The chances aren't great, but you could. So just the same as this one, if you have four or five offspring, they could all be there. They could all be like that. Not likely, but could be. So, just to recap, all this information here are the various ratios that you can get. Um, I suggest that you, you, you should write these down. Um, we've come across some of them already. If you take a homozygous dominant crossed with a homozygous recessive, you're going to get all heterozygous, so your ratio is effectively naught, four to nothing. If you've got a heterozygous crossed with another heterozygous one, so an, an organism with a dominant and recessive allele crossed with the same, you end up with the three to one ratio, which we talked about in our monohybrid crosses. Homozygous recessive crossed with heterozygous, like with the back cross, you'll get half of them being um, homozygous and half being heterozygous, one to one. And codominance, which we haven't come on to in, in the lesson yet, um, heterozygous cross with the heterozygous, you end up with three different possibilities. And we'll come, across, come up with that in a few moments. So it's worth remembering those ratios because they are all ratios that you'll come across during the course of this topic. So, looking at codominance, what does it mean? If both alleles show in the phenotype in the heterozygous condition, this is called codominance. So, in other words, you have red flower parent reproducing with white flower parent, two different alleles, and the resultant offspring are pink. So you've got both of the alleles being expressed. There's a slightly different terminology, a different um, system of um, naming the alleles. If we've got, for example, red and white alleles, you choose a letter, not either red or white, but a common letter which relates to the characteristics. So I've chosen C for colour, because we're talking here about the colour of the flowers. And use small superscript letters for each allele. So, a red flower, this is the allele, R for red, R for red, remember, you've got a pair of alleles in the, um, in the genotype. Here's the white one, and the pink one is the red allele and the white allele, where both are being expressed. So the idea of having a 
common letter which relates to the overall type of characteristic. It might be C for colour, H for height, um, S for size, whatever it happens to be. And then the individual variants you put as superscript capital letters above the, um, the letter C. So that's the best way of doing it. Now, this is our 1 to 2 to 1 ratio that came up just now. Crossing pink flowers, they must both be heterozygous because they've got the red allele and the white allele. But you take two of these and cross them, there are three possible outcomes. Here's the, um, the gametes from each flower. There's a red allele in this gamete and a white allele in this gamete. And here's the other parent red allele and white allele. You can see you do the cross. There's a red, op red option, a white option, and two pink options. CRCW. CRCW to the pink. So there's that one to two to one ratio that we came across uh, on, the, on the previous slide. So codominance will tend to give you at least three different options. So far we've only been looking at characteristics that contain two alleles, things like pea, pea plant size, two alleles, one for tall, one for short, um, eye colour, one for brown, one for blue, etc. In most cases, in reality, genes are expressed in more than three, more than two different alleles, sometimes three, sometimes four, five, six in different characteristics of different, different organisms. And this is what we call multiple alleles. Um, the most common example is blood groups. There are three different alleles for blood. And we see we use the same idea, find a letter, and then you've got A, B and O are the three different alleles that can be expressed by that particular gene. In the case of blood, IA and IB are co-dominant, so they are equally dominant to each other. IO is recessive to both IA and IB. Okay, now that's a useful piece of information, and whenever you're doing a question related to multiple alleles, that's the first thing that you need to sort out in your mind. Which ones are dominant to others? Is there are any co-dominant? Which is the one that's recessive to everybody, or everything? Here's an example. There we are. So, genotype. These are all the various genotypes and blood groups that you can get. If you have inherited the IA allele from your father and the IA allele from your mother, you will be blood group A. If you have inherited the A from your mother and the B from your father, you'll be blood group B and so on. So there are a couple of different ways that you can have blood group A. That one or that one. Remember that O is recessive to both A and B. So just like in any monohybrid cross, if you've inherited the dominant allele from one parent and the recessive from the other, you will show the dominant allele in your phenotype. So the only way that you can be blood group O is if you inherit the O allele from each of your two parents, and then you cannot be anything else except blood group O. This is the point I made just now. With a large number of alleles, it's always important to begin a question by ranking the alleles in order of dominance. You will usually be given pointers to this in the question. There's often quite a lot of information about the different alleles in the question. And if you read through it and understand it, you can effectively rank the alleles. So you will work out which is the most dominant and which is ultimately the most recessive of the alleles. And the key point for starting questions on um, this sort of inheritance is this. If the allele that is recessive to everything else 
appears in the phenotype. One allele must have come from one of each parent, just like this one. O, blood group O, is recessive. The, the O allele is recessive to all the others. So if you are blood group O, the only way that can have happened is you've inherited one of these alleles from each of your parents. So that tells you something about your parents. They must have got at least one of these alleles in their blood group. So if they happen to be blood group B, for example, they can't be that. They've got to be that. Because they've got to have allowed you to inherit that particular alley. So this is very key to the whole idea of questions on this. Remember that if the allele that is recessive to everything else appears in the phenotype, one of those alleles must have come from each of the parents. Very important. And if you get that right to begin with in these questions, then the rest of it seems to fall into place. Now, another thing, sex inheritance. This is very straightforward. Um, you all basically know that there are two sex chromosomes, an X and a Y. The other 22 pairs of chromosomes are different to the sex chromosomes. So in humans, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. So in other words, in every one of your cells, you have 46 chromosomes arranged in homologous pairs by and large. 22 of the pairs are referred to as autosomes and are homologous. They, in other words, they carry the same genes. Each of a homologous pair of chromosomes contains the same genes. You've inherited one from your mother and one from your father. The third pair of chromosomes are not homologous because they're different sizes and they contain different genes. So you have the X chromosome and you have the Y chromosome. And you've inherited one from one parent and one from the other. You have to have inherited, if you're, if you're, if you're a boy, you have to have inherited that chromosome from your father, obviously, because that's what he's got, and therefore that one's come from your mother. The X chromosome is much longer than the Y chromosome and carries more genes. A person with two X chromosomes, XX is female, and a person with one X chromosome and one Y chromosome, referred to as XY, is male. Now that is important when we come to talk about the next aspect of this lesson, and that is sex linkage. The genes that occur on the part of the X chromosome that are not um, next to the Y chromosome, shouldn't have rubbed those out, there's an X and a Y chromosome. So all the genes that occur in this section here are not paired with another one in the homologous chromosome next to it, because it's not there. So the characteristics that appear on this part of the X chromosome are referred to as sex-linked characteristics. And they are only required to have one allele to express the characteristic. Remember that everything we've talked about so far, you've got pairs of alleles. It might be homozygous, in which case you've got two the same, or heterozygous, one dominant and one recessive. Here, you've only got one allele on that particular chromosome, and there's nothing to match it on there. So, in autosomes, this is what I've just gone over, the expression of the recessive allele is less common than the dominant allele, because as long as one dominant allele is present, it will always be expressed in the phenotype. So, even if you've got a recessive allele there, you're still going to express the dominant characteristic if you are heterozygous for that character. So, take eye colour, 
if you, if you have capital B and small b, it doesn't matter that the small b is there, it won't be expressed in the phenotype. So there's more opportunities for the dominant allele to come through in the phenotype, either because it's homozygous dominant or because it's heterozygous. You'll still have brown eyes. But in this case, it's different. If a recessive allele is on the part of the X chromosome that's not paired with the Y chromosome, in other words, the top bit that I showed you just now, it will be expressed in the phenotype. So it's very easy for recessive characteristics to appear because they can never be masked by the dominant allele because there is only one allele to consider. So, in a genetic cross, how do we work a genetic cross with sex linkage? You can do exactly the same thing. You can draw Punnett square diagrams, except that with sex linkage, you are always expected to indicate the sex of the organism. So you're expected to show where the X and the Y chromosomes come in the cross. And the sex-linked gene appears as a superscript letter beside the X chromosome. The Y chromosome is always on its own. So, for example, in the case of the genotype of a man who has normal blood, his genotype will be X, H for normal hemoglobin, Y. Remember, the Y chromosome doesn't have an allele here because it's on the bit that sticks up above the, above the Y chromosome. A woman who has normal blood and is homozygous for normal blood would have that as her genotype. A man who is haemophiliac will have the recessive allele and so his genotype will look like that. And there's a fourth option. A woman can be a carrier of um, haemophilia. Because she's got two X chromosomes. But just like in any other monohybrid inheritance, the fact that she's got the recessive allele doesn't matter to her because it's masked by the dominant one and so she will have normal blood. So you've got four possibilities. You've got a normal male, you've got a haemophiliac male, you've got a normal female, and a carrier female. And that's what I've just shown there. Okay, what is haemophilia? Basically, it's when blood doesn't clot normally. Um, and as I've said just now, it is sex-linked because it's caused by a recessive allele that's carried on the part of the X chromosome that isn't matched up against the Y chromosome. So it cannot be homologous. If the male has the recessive allele, then he has the disease. So a haemophiliac male who's got the recessive allele on his, y, on his X chromosome is going to have haemophilia. The female mostly can be either normal or a carrier because as I said right at the beginning of this section the chances are that if you've got two chromosomes with two alleles the, the two alleles are either going to be both dominant or a dominant and a recessive. The third possibility is that they're both recessive but obviously the dominant phenotype has more chance of coming through. So the female only gets the disease if she inherits two recessive alleles. And my point about the heterozygous bit that I made just now, if on the X chromosome the female has got one normal allele and one recessive allele, she is referred to as a carrier of haemophilia. And so can pass that characteristic, pass the disease on to the next generation. And here is a situation where the cross between a haemophiliac man and a carrier woman, just as an example. So, 
What's the parent phenotype in the haemophiliac man? Remember, we have to start off by giving the XY. And if he is haemophiliac, he must have the recessive allele. Where is the recessive allele going to be marked? On the X chromosome, because it doesn't occur on the Y. And the carrier woman, she's got normal blood. So she's going to have the normal allele, the dominant allele, which will mask the recessive allele that she's carrying. Okay, I should have put that down there basically. So the parent phenotype is haemophiliac man for that one and carrier woman for that one. What are the gametes? This is exactly the same process as we do with um, monohybrid inheritance. So here is the pair of homologous chromosomes. So the gametes are X, H and Y for the man, and the female gametes are X, H and X, little h. So there are the gametes. And then we simply put that into a Punnett square diagram. in the usual way. So, remember from last lesson, there's the male side, haemophiliac man, carrier female, normal but carrier, and then you do the cross. So, if with four children, it's possible to have a daughter who is a carrier, or a daughter who is haemophiliac. It's impossible for this particular cross to result in a daughter who is normal homozygous, because she's got to inherit, to be normal and homozygous, you'd have to inherit two of the H's, and there's only one there, because that one is a small H. She could be a carrier, a daughter could be a carrier, inheriting the X allele from the father, and the X allele from, sorry, there we are, the X allele from the father, and the X um, H allele from the mother. So there's the carrier. Could be a normal male. He happens to have inherited the H from his mother, so that makes him normal. So this man is not carrying haemophilia. He had a haemophiliac father, but he himself hasn't got haemophilia and obviously can't pass it on to the next generation. Or he could be a haemophiliac, where he's inherited the H from the carrier mother and the Y from the father. So there are four possibilities there. That brings us to the end of this lesson. You'll need to use some of this information in the assignment that I've asked you to do.